Just in case things go deep, we got donuts to bail us out. Thank you. Stop having an epileptic fit. Here you go, kid. Here you go. Should I take it now? No, no, next week. Yeah, <laughs> now. Okay. <laughs> right, let's start this fucking thing. Woo. This show is brought to you by Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals for free. That's right. You get your first three meals for free and there's free shipping. When you go to blueapron.com slash joey. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash joey. Our show is also brought to you by Indochino. Indochino is offering our listeners any premium suit for just $3.99. That's up to 50% off. And to get that, you go to Indochino.com and enter promo code CHURCH at checkout. And to make it even better, they're paying for shipping. So go to Indochino.com and enter promo code CHURCH at checkout. The show is also brought to you by Onnit.com. Go to Onnit.com and use code word CHURCH to save 10% on all their amazing optimization products like Alpha Brain, New Mood Immune, New Mood, Shumtech Immune, and Shumtech Sport. Wednesday night, cocksuckers. Here we go. Taking a little psychological ride with you and shit. Kick that muley. Kick that mule. They want to hear this. They want to hear this. Oh, shit. What? It's a church of what's happening now, motherfuckers. Coming at you direct. Lee Syatt. Uncle Joey. Here we go. Black Lives Matter. There you go. Listen to this shit right here. There you go. A white dude could never play that bass. That's all funk. That's all soul. How can you shoot that motherfucker? He had a weapon. No, he had a base. What's happening, you bad motherfuckers? Uncle Joey here with his main goomba on his 28th fucking birthday. Thank you so much. My main man, Lee Syatt. What's going on? How was your birthday today, my brother? It was good. It was, um, when I first got here, it used to bum me out when I used to work on my birthday. Like, I forget what comedian has a joke about it. I think it might be Jim Gaffigan. Having to work on your birthday sucks. But it's just, uh, it's kind of weird. It's kind of turned into, like, almost any other day. But it's always, it's just nice to get to talk to people that I haven't got to talk to in a while. Who'd you talk to? I talked to uh, Steve Simone. I talked to Johnny Rock. I talked to my parents a couple times. Had lunch with Paula. It was the... I had to talk again for that. You were going to have a lonely fucking birthday. I was going to have a lonely, but she's stunning for the bar, so I Who just... Who gives a fuck? Nobody has a lonely birthday. What, are you fucking crazy? I get, uh... I talk a lot of shit about birthdays. I talk a lot of shit about birthdays because, you know, I live in L.A. We live in L.A., and people invite you to these 7 o'clock <laughs> birthday parties in L.A., and they're a bunch of jerk-offs. They, you know, they drive in traffic, and there's eight people, nine people. They have to be prevent don't show up. This guy shows up with this guy... And it's a fucking, and then the tab comes and everybody's looking at each other with rabbit ears. And there you are fucking paying for that. You know, it's a fucking nightmare. I hate those birthday parties. They're too fucking fake for me. But uh, whenever somebody has a birthday, whenever somebody says it's their birthday, I think back to my fucking 23rd birthday. You know, that's what I always think back to. Was it good or bad? It was just, it wasn't that it was good or bad. It's that I spent it alone. But it was at a time when I didn't need to spend it alone. Like, I just needed some communication. And I had a little communication in the daytime, but that was it. I was on my own the rest of the day. 
And I took care of myself. I had like a, my favorite Chinese food, and I had a little bit of pot. You know, it wasn't a bad day. Like I was under a fucking wall or something. Right. But I always remembered how uh, it just made me weird that I was alone. And that's why tonight, like when we were coming back, we were going to eat. Yeah, I asked you. I picked up Mercy, and I go, what do you want to do? And she goes, I want to go home. I go, it's Lee's birthday. What do you want to do? And she's like, get cake, get cake. You know, so I go, I was going to go get a cake anyway, Carvel. But you said you had to eat with Paula, so I wanted to take you to this new Italian place. We got turned on to that. Even the baby eats there. It's fucking delicious. So uh, we stopped it and got you the cake. And uh, listen, man, it's not like it's a $1,000 fucking car or, uh, you know. It, but you don't need, like, it's, uh, to, if I'm being honest with you, like, I, like last night, because I, I knew I was going to be alone today. Like, I thought I was going to be alone today. And you're right, you don't need to be. But I, I'm I always do that. I always put stuff in my head that like, nah, I won't bother anybody. No, 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 no. It's not that you don't bother anybody. It's that um, there's just this thing in life that it's a part of being decent, you know, where you just tell somebody happy birthday. But if you know their circumstance or whatever, and it's nice just to do something out of the fucking ordinary, you know, with people. I hate when people try to buy your birthday, you know, like. Uh, give you like an expensive suit or something I've always hated those birthday presents I like when somebody calls me and says let's go to movies I know you want to go to that movie your birthday's on Monday let's go see the one o'clock you, you, you know there's nothing going on on Monday you know what I'm saying like that's the kind of shit you do on your birthday after a certain age that in my mind a nice fucking lunch a nice fucking movie two tutsuruts you go home you take a nap right and then you have family dinner with your fucking family and they break your balls and you go to bed. That's your birthday. That's as hard as I want my fucking birthday. Yeah, you know, with people who really know you. Yeah. But I don't like the fucking shigma gigs and people showing up and it's at a bar. That shit drives me crazy. At what point for you did gifts become weird? I'm at that point now. People ask me, like my parents keep asking me, I'm like, I don't really need anything. Like I feel bad asking for a gift from you guys. I always feel weird when I get a gift from somebody, especially somebody from like the podcast that listens to the podcast, and I know how you justify it. I justify it by knowing that we put out a free podcast and entertains them at work for an hour, and maybe if they didn't have a podcast, they would, uh, you know, if they didn't have serious, serious is on all I don't know, a year or something like that. So people give you gifts and I don't mind those they're very thoughtful when you're on the road they're oh, very yeah. thoughtful and you bring them home and you're like that was so nice of him to bring fucking Pink Floyd or send it to me in the mail or you know and those are the type of gifts because like when it's I mean everything that I've seen or been given on the road is always something usually something small because it has to be they, they, they have to give it to you they give but, me shirts but mercy. they know they know exactly what you like well, like, or they listen to the podcast yeah exactly to listen to the fucking podcast, which makes it, it's like you're going to give me a wallet. You know, who needs a fucking wallet? I love my old wallet, you know what I'm saying? I go, I stay with a wallet till I'm broke, and I throw it away. Once you're broke, then you throw the wallet away. It's a kiss of death. But if it's a good wallet, if you're okay with it, you're making a little money, fuck, you keep the wallet. I don't care how, I don't care if the flaps are falling off that motherfucker. If it's bringing you gitas, you hold on to that That's fucking wallet. That's when a wallet really begins, is when it starts yeah, falling apart. Yeah, when it starts falling apart, and you got to make adjustments. You got to put that picture of grandma in the drawer instead of Carrie. Who gives a fuck? She's dead. You cast the check. It's over. She, she's on some planet, whatever the fuck. Who knows? I don't know. Uh, it's just really weird that I, I just don't like uh, spending birthdays. Ever since that birthday, that birthday really solidified it with me. And like I said, I don't want to go to an amusement park. I don't want to have nothing. I don't want 100 happy birthdays on fucking Facebook or MySpace or whatever the fuck it is. I just want you to just treat me normally. That's it. I don't want to go fucking to a party. I don't want to wear kazoo hats. I do it at the house now for mercy. We got a Carvel cake tonight. Did we not? Absolutely. A small yeah. one. Oh, yeah, it was nice. And it was delicious. So the Diaz family tradition is when there's a birthday, you got a small Carvel cake, whether you want it or not. Whether you want it or not, that's it. That's the best we could do for you is a small Carvel cake. She was so excited. I came in. She was like, we have a surprise. There's cake. And I was like, oh. and, and there's nothing. I knew it was gonna be a Carvel cake because it's you. <laughs> like you never. There's no. There's no other cake for you. There's no vanilla cake. Do you ever have cake like that? Or are you just you're a Carvel man? Listen, there's two cakes I like. 
There's that fucking Carvel cake and that chocolate death from that fucking restaurant you go to over in Burbank. Oh, yeah. That's it. I'm part of I'm, it. After a while, all fucking cake tastes the same. They, it all tastes like somebody made it from fucking Betty Crocker, and that shit drives me crazy. If you're going to make me a Betty Crocker cake, listen, don't bring a Betty Crocker cake to the fucking thing. Leave it next to the ranch dressing because I'm already Betty Crocker the fuck out. How many Betty Crocker cakes can you eat in your fucking life? 8,000. Yeah, delicious. you eat that, that, yeah, they're delicious when you're 22 and 16, but when you're 40 and they show up with that cream cheese fucking dressing, I'm going to stab you in the fucking neck. Be original. Switch up on the fucking frostings. I know what that fucking shit looks like. That, that, that. Uh, whatever, that cup that comes that you lick the sides, when that thing dries a little bit, that's cancer. <laughs> Look at it. When that chocolate dries on the spoon, that's cancer. Why do you think I got two of those CBD drops now? Because I'm scared of all those fucking spoons I licked with that fucking cancer on it. You know how many containers of that shit I ate when I was a kid just getting high? You would eat ca containers of, of frosting? That frosting shit that come me and three other fucking savages in Aspen. That. When I lived in Snowmass, the guys from Mankato upstairs would eat that shit at night when they got high. What would you dip it in? Dip like A spoon. Just spoon, straight frosting? Three of us with three fucking spoons. Bam, bam, <laughs> bam. Bam, bam, bam. That chocolate fr uh, fudge, whatever. That's cancer. You could taste the cancer particles as you're eating it. Yeah, it's like all chemicals. It's yeah. delicious. Yeah. No, no, no. And you know what? It's like, the, it don't even, it's like hostess cakes. I grew up on hostess cakes. Those fucking apple pies, delicious. Those, uh... The yo-yo, whatever the fuck they are, the circle thing with the whatever in the middle made by Hostess. Look at the, what, what are yum-yums? Yodel. Yodels, I think. Yodels, those things. I grew up on those fucking things. You look at a yodel, that's cancer. Those little cancer sticks, that's cancer. But they're fucking delicious. While you're eating them, you're like, chemo can suck my dick. You don't give a fuck about that <laughs> shit. It's the truth. Go down and get one of those apple pies now. They're fucking, they're still delicious. And you know you're getting diabetes. Like, as you're eating it, look at the calorie count on it. It's like each apple pie is 600 fucking calories. I never even tried those. So are those, like, just little handheld apple pies yeah, at 7-Eleven? Yeah, those, those Hostess pies that now everybody makes. Like, three, the, the ISIS makes one. <laughs> fucking 7-Eleven took over the company. They make one, and then... Uh, Hostess has made it since Jesus left Chicago, and all of a sudden, Seven Eleven fucking steals the idea. How are the ISIS ones? Are the ISIS ones good? <sighs> They're not bad. <laughs> They're not bad. I had one one night in desperation somewhere. They're not bad. I love those apple pies, dog. I grew up on Thirty Eighth Street. We, went, we walked up to the fucking uh, the dragon, the Chinese dragon. That's the first thing when you walked in there. When you walked into Hashways, that's the first thing you saw—a rack for fucking Hostess cakes. The donuts, the chocolate donuts are delicious. They make a box of chocolate donuts. You ever take a box of Hostess chocolate donuts, the little one, the donuts? Of course, a box. Oh, yeah, you go for Oh, my box. God, I've probably eaten enough for a display. Those things, I like the I like the glazed ones. And you know what? Those are the only time I get powdered donuts. Those I little white ones. I, I never buy powdered donuts. Yeah, those little white ones are good. You know what they're good with? What? What do I hate? Milk. Oh. But you know what those powdered donuts are good with? Milk. You dip those powdered donuts in a little bit of milk. <laughs> let it drain really good so that you can't taste the milk. Fucking delicious. <laughs> Fucking delicious. You understand me? Fucking delicious. Oh, my God. So how are you feeling, man? How's the nose feeling? The nose is fucking tremendous. I got to give kudos to Dr. Mazza and do uh, Dr. Lyon's office. <laughs> Everything is beautiful. I'm sniffing. I'm off the fucking Afrin uh, two weeks now, ten days, whatever. Um, I'm breathing. It's overwhelming at first when you walk and when you go on the elliptical and when you do kettlebells. I mean, but I have to reprogram my breathing. So I had to start reading Dr. Belisa's book from scratch again. And that's what I started doing Saturday was just doing those exercises that she teaches. You know, the, 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 the cat, uh, the cat cow position, exhaling and breathing, sitting down and feeling your fucking pelvis. So I've been doing that again just to try to get... I want The next mission is to get the sleep apnea mask off. So we got to shrink the fucking neck. I'm not going under surgery. That means we're going into deep fucking murky waters of exercise. I got a new plan going on. So, so. if you lose, like, weight, you'll be able to get rid of the sleep apnea I mask? hope so. I hope so. I burned a lot of this fat around my fucking neck. If you look at pictures from the longest yard and shit, my neck has shrunk a lot. You know what I'm saying? You could see my Adam's apple again. There was a while there. You can see it was just a fucking string from here down. Now I've got the fat hanging from the fucking meat that was in there. Oh, yeah. The, the, I'm not going to go get that out. I don't give a fuck, dog. No, no more surgeries? 
No, I would never do a vanity surgery like that. Have they asked you to? Have they been like, oh, you can do this? Talk, no, or? no, nobody says nothing to you. I'm just saying that I don't want to do plastic surgery or nothing like that. That's not my world. Nothing. You know, knock on wood. I've never really had a fuck with that stuff, and I don't really want to do that stuff. I ain't going to get no better looking at this point. What, what the fuck am I going to do to me? You're going to tighten my skin around my eyes? What are you going to do? I had a, a birthmark removed when I was really young, and it, act, it ended up fucking me up because it was on my leg. And I had a lower locker because I'm a midget, so I like I had to I always have the lower locker. And I I bend down and all my stitches popped, so now like I don't have feeling in like half of like my upper thigh. Like, yeah, you gotta be careful with yeah, those surgeries. There's no reason to do those. I gotta go see Doctor Amy because since the surgery, I got a pain in my left wrist. I got the original pain I had in there. It was really weird. Maybe it was the anesthesia. You get effects after a surgery. So when I woke up from the surgery, guys, my my Tuesday and Wednesday night, I couldn't even fucking sleep from the pain in my wrist. It would wake me up in the middle of the night if I had left my wrist twisted or something. So I would have to sleep on my right side, and the pillow there was too high, and it kept slanting my mask. It was two nights of fucking horror. The wrist pain was so fucking bad. Now, now I stretched it. I did the fucking exercises. And now the pain, that same little pain, has shifted back to my left, my right knee. So that means there's a pain, there's a, an energy that's trapped in there. I gotta go to Dr. Amy to stick some fucking needles. And I gotta tell you something, Dr. Amy hasn't even called me to check in on me one fucking time. So I'm really surprised. That's crazy. That's crazy, yeah. I thought about today, well, I haven't spoken to Dr. Amy. She wanted me to come down last Thursday. She goes, I'll call you Wednesday night and ask you to see how you are. I never heard from Dr. Amy again, so it's kind of fucked up. I got to call her tomorrow instead. Maybe I got to wake her up out of the fucking grave. But something weird happened today, man. Something weird happened that I don't like. I had to talk to her. But but in talking to that friend of mine, um, I remembered something. You know, I often think about my life, and I think about the gaps that let me get involved in the things I got involved in. You know, unless you're a fucking moron, you have to look back at your life and go, okay, when was the first time I did heroin? Well, I did heroin in my mom's basement when I was uh, 16 at 3.30 in the afternoon when she wasn't home because she was out playing fucking cards and your dad was working until 9 o'clock at night. So you always think about those holes in your game as a young man. So someday when you become a parent, you know, you don't have those holes in your game. I came from a home that my mom respected me, and I loved her, and she loved me. But, you know, uh, you act up. You act up, Lee, and something has to be done. My mom had a couple different punishments. You know, she had uh, attacking me and smacking me and sending me to my room punishment or the punish. The, you punish for a week punishment, no fucking TV, that type of stuff, which is, which is the standard. I could look you in the eye as a man and say I was not abused as a child, uh, beat up or anything. Everything that came to me, I got. You follow me? I'm one of those guys. I tell you the truth about that type of stuff. So I understood that. But a friend of mine posted something, a dear friend of mine who I love dearly, posted something on Facebook. That was a weird question about his child. That his child wouldn't stop hitting. What do you recommend? And I saw it late last night and I read the post of these fucking people. And some of it was bullshit, but some of it was meant. I don't believe in hitting a child, Lee. I don't believe in attacking a child. But let me explain something to you. You always have to maintain with that child that you're an authority figure. And that's very hard to do. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's a hard job because, to have. Because you love them so much and you don't want to, like, you don't want to yell at them? Or, like, what, what, what's the reason? Because you love them so much, one, two. It's like if you had a job in a warehouse. If I was a boss in a warehouse and I had an eight-man crew and we loaded trucks that night, I would treat you with respect and give you a lot of love. So if there was a problem, you come to me and we could fix it. But at the same time, with all that love and all that respect, I told you about my work ethics. We're only taking break times off. We're working straight. Listen, you want to get out of here early? We'll work through lunch and we'll get out of here early. Done. Let's go. We're all in business. If somebody can't come in one night to load a truck, let us know and we'll fix it for you. We'll cover for you. We'll all be prepared to, you know what I'm saying? Where people wouldn't quit. 
people would want to come into the job whether they were getting ten dollars an hour or twenty two dollars an hour. <coughs> you ever you ever have a boss in a situation where they're just scumbags to you? All the time. I mean, okay. Did it, you ever figure out where they were fucking coming from? Did you ever think to yourself like, where's this fucking moron coming from? Yeah, <coughs> I mean, I would really. I would think a lot about, like, I would get bummed. I would, Why would this guy act this way over this fucking Because they job? have a sad life or something like that. That's what it, it's the weirdest fucking thing. So I could never see myself acting like that, even towards a child. Listen, I'm not going to tell you Mercy is the perfect child because she's fucking not. Mercy still has a lot of buck wild little things. I told my wife the other day, Mercy has a couple tendencies that scare the shit out of me, but at the same time, I'm happy she has them. Oh, my God, that's tough. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I see her tonight in front of you. She wouldn't stop till I said, I'm sorry. And you kept asking, like, why? Why would I, why, what did I do? And she was like, no, just say it. You, you follow me? She has that quality where <laughs> she'll say, I'm sorry to you. She'll, uh, I hear a lot of fucking, no, I not. And I got to hear my wife getting rough with her a little sometimes. My wife will say, get up get up, you know, and stuff like that, but I'll go to check what's going on, and I get where Mercy's coming from. Do I like that she's telling my wife, no, I'm not? Not really, but this is going to this is gonna be another situation in her life where somebody's going to say something, to her, and she's going to say, no, I'm not. I'm not fucking doing that. That's the tendency that I like when she says it. The, the, the situation that she's saying it to her mom since the age of three, and she said it to me a couple times, and I'll look at her and talk to her in Spanish, and it ends. She puts her head there. And then I'll ask her to apologize. She'll give me like 10 minutes. Sometimes she'll apologize. Sometimes I put her in a timeout. I don't dream of hitting mercy or choking her butt. Um, and a lot of guys that listen to the podcast, Timmy, you know, listen to the podcast a lot. He knows that we grew up in homes that when we get hit a certain age as men, we get a little froggy with our dads. And our dads have to put us in our place. You know what I'm saying? A, if you come from a particular household, one day your brother comes in and he's like, I'm not doing that. And your dad's like, what are you talking about? And you're like, I'm not doing that. Next thing you know, it's a fucking wrestling match in your living room, bro. You know? And it gets ugly in some homes. But at that point, that dad has to crush that whole thought that he has. He has to push that situation to the limit. Do you understand me? I do, but here's the thing, though. In doing that, like, how do you make sure that you don't crush out the thing that you want in mercy? Like, that, no, I not. Like, you have to discipline her <coughs> so she doesn't do it to to your wife and you, but you, you don't want to crush it out of her. Like, right. Like, no, 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 no. I just try to talk to her when she says, no, I not. That the I try to talk to her about it. And I know that at this age now, it's bad for her to talk to me as parents. Right. But... Later on, I'll remind her that no, I'm not. Okay, that Under makes sense. Different situations, and she'll have it already inside her because she's been saying that for a year now. So, what I'm trying to explain to you when you have a man in the house, like in this situation with my friend, something happened at school. I don't really know the whole ups and downs to say this, but he seemed a little concerned. And I said, there's two times in life where a man has to step up to his child. And it's right now with him and his child where you have to scare him more than hit him. Do you see what I'm talking to? Absolutely. I'm still scared of my parents. So I told him that to sit him down tonight and explain to him, you know, I don't care if he's five, that he can't do what he's doing anymore and think the way he does anymore. And he can't raise his hands to his siblings, blah, 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 nobody else. And the next time he does, that there's going to be some problems. And at that point, he comes home one day, three days later, and this kid's in trouble again. You know, uh, he hasn't really ever struck him or whatever. And you don't want to strike your child, but you also want to let him know who's running the operation. And I told him, grab him by the back of the neck. You throw him up out of the chair. You drag him to the bathroom on the floor and take an extra walk with him, dragging him, ripping his shirt in the meantime. You get to the bathroom, you throw him in the cold water. You pick him up, you rip his clothes off, and you put him in the cold water, you take him out, and you whip him with a belt. You put him in the cold water, and you whip him, 
you dry him off and you make him go in his room naked. And he's in there for seven days, Papillon style, only to come out and eat. Not even to come out and eat. He eats his meals in there. And while he's in there for entertainment, he's got to write, I will not disobey or I will not disrespect or I will not raise my hand to such and such till his fucking fingers bleed. If he's not in school, that's what he's doing. And it was so weird about well, me telling her the story. I remember where I got this from. And let me tell you something. The person who did this, today in today's world, all three of those children are successful. The two girls married their high school sweethearts. They did not do drugs. The boy did drugs. But today, they're fine. They all got college degrees. They all paid back their loans. When I was a child, my mom was a godmother to a girl in Miami. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And in return, his father, the girl's father, Jacqueline, was my dad's best friend from Cuba. Like they had grown up together. Okay. So for some reason, he was away. And he was supposed to be my godfather, but Gabby stepped in and covered for me. This guy's name was Rodolfo, okay? And I was very young. I was very lucky at a young age. And I was telling my wife this, that I want this for my daughter if something happens to me, that I wanted to take cultural vacations. Not to a different country or nothing, but different parts of the country, especially some a part of the country that is in her roots. Like for me, it was Miami. So my mom would send me by myself to Miami from the age of 6 to 13. I would go to Miami every summer for three weeks, maybe four, and I would stay with this family and on one condition, that I did it accordingly to their rules. So I had to behave myself. <clears throat> My mom would give me a, uh, a couple hundred and to give to them, and they were allotted to give it to me. Okay. Okay, at that age. So my mom would give me 500 for four weeks, and I had to give it to them. And when I asked them for 20 bucks to buy lunch for my cousins, they would say yes, and they would give me the money. It was a really good score. Now, would you look forward to it as a kid? or Fuck yeah. Yeah? Fuck yeah. It was three weeks, four weeks of being on a, on a beautiful property and going to the beaches and going to baseball camp and going to more beaches and going to people's swimming pools and cooking outside and it was uh, a surreal life he loved me and i loved him the kids i loved them and they loved me but the point of this fucking story was he was what he was but in real life she was a professor in cuba and she had been raised in a certain way in cuba she was a beautiful woman she's still alive today Okay, my uncle Rodolfo, he's dead and buried ten times already. This woman did whatever they did, but one day had three kids and stopped and became a mom. And in the meantime, she, you know, not like my mom, she took care of herself and she had hobbies. And yeah, from time to time, she would have a cocktail. But in the summers, part of our deal, if I went down there, was that I had to do a curriculum, whatever Vivian said to me. Like a schoolwork? Oh, yeah. So even if you didn't have school, it didn't mean you were going to play all day. So let's say we would get up at 6 and eat breakfast and stuff like that, and then we'd watch TV for an hour, and by 8, we all had to go into the kitchen. And she'd buy workshops, work workbooks, for like, you know, this is crazy. She'd buy American workbooks, and we'd have to sit there and work on math, English, reading, geography, we, for, for how long? Till about 11 o'clock for three hours. And then she would, from there we'd go to lunch or something, and then we'd come back home and do the same for another hour. But in that hour, instead of all of us doing it, Jacqueline would play the piano while we were doing work. So the mother would sit with us, help us with our homework, and at the same time listen to Jacqueline and play the fucking piano. And be like, oh, you messed up there. You messed up there. Do it again. Do it again. Let's go. And she'd sing it. So she'd be working with three fucking kids and at the same time working with Jacqueline on the piano. Oh now, my God. We, they had a nephew. You know, the two girls were great. But the little boy was a fuck up. 
He was the middle. And I shouldn't say fuck up. He was just a little boy that was surrounded with girls year round. When you have two girls and you grow up as a boy in the middle, you lose your fucking mind from time to time. They fuck with your shit, you know, and they get into a fist fight. So he had a rule in this house he couldn't hit his sisters. But sometimes his sisters hit him and he couldn't stay hit, so he would push him. And then he would get jacked up. Let me tell you how they would fucking punish this kid. No matter what happened, where it was, what time of the day it was, let's say we were outside climbing a tree. And the sister came out, the younger sister, and she would say something to him, help me go up to the tree. And he would go, all right. And he would help her up. They'd get into an argument. She'd throw a twig at him. And with his luck, he would throw a twig at her, but it would hit her in the eye. And then she'd run in, bleeding, dog. They would just, she would come out the mother and say, Ofito, come here. <laughs> I mean, this was criminal. And when Ofito would walk up, she would reach her hand behind his fucking neck. And basically he'd pick him up like a clean and then just turn around and he'd be dragging. And he'd go, I didn't hit her. I didn't hit her. And on the walk over there, his shirt would be ripping. This is where I got this from. His shirt would be ripping. And he'd be yelling. And it would be in a split fucking secondly. Like, like I didn't hit him. Like, well, it was just fucking crazy. Like me and you were just playing. You and I were just throwing spitballs at each other. And all of a sudden the third spitball seemed to hit you in the fucking eye. I was right there. It wasn't on purpose. But she didn't give a fuck because she would say to him before the whole game started, listen, if something happens, don't say no to me later. But that was his luck. That no matter when she said that. Like if we were playing, like one day we were fucking hitting eggs or something. Like I, I don't know what we were doing. He had that luck that everything would just go wrong for him. He was always a year younger than me. We communicate today. And that's why I was thinking about this. She would rip him by the fucking neck, drag him to the shower, put cold water on, and throw him in the shower with clothes off. And sometimes while he was in the shower, she'd smack him with the belt, depending on the severity of what he had done, or sometimes she would rip his fucking clothes off, dry him off, and then put him in his bedroom. And you know what the punishment was? He had a kneel on two beans. For hours, Lee. Hours in the fucking room, facing the wall, kneeling on two beans. Trust me, she made me kneel on two beans for a fucking couple hours here and there. Because she'd give you options. Either I whip the fuck out of you, either you could write, or you could kneel on beans all day naked. And you'd have to kneel on beans naked, facing the fucking wall. And the sisters would walk by and giggle at him and shit. He would cry, stop it, Gina, mommy, Gina's making fun of me. And she'd come in. And... That would happen one time to me. Like, I'm not going back to Aunt Karen's house ever again. Like, that's on, like, that never happened. And, like, I probably got spanked maybe under ten times. They wouldn't spank me. I remember doing the fucking lines, the punishment lines. And I also remember kneeling on the beans. And I also remember doing yard work for four fucking days straight that was torturous with no gloves with you know like she would make you feel Why are the you punishment. in trouble so much at this you know we would throw rocks i would be a new york city kid that would go to miami and i would do new york city stuff in a different fucking thing that they never saw before and they would do things i had never seen before do you follow what i'm saying to you so we would ride bicycles and they'd say don't do this and all of a sudden me and, like, I don't know, they would say, we were like, uh, let's say I was eight and Ofito was six. They would say, don't do, don't pop wheelies on the bikes. Okay. Because I would send the bike down. Or I would just, I would save my money all year and buy a bike. And when I went to Sears down there, buy the bicycle. So when I would go down there in the summers, I had my own bicycle. Okay. So I could ride around with them. In those days, you could ride a bicycle without a helmet and knee pads, and you'd have to be fucking dressed to armor to ride a bicycle. It was suburbia. It was real suburbia. There really wasn't any traffic. We could ride around this block 2,000 times before we saw a car in those days. Wow, okay. So we all had bicycles down there. So let's say they'd say to us, don't pop wheelies. And all of a sudden, Ofito would fucking fall off the bike, and they'd say, how'd you pop a wheelie? No, how'd you hurt yourself? I popped the wheelie. Then I tell you not to pop a wheelie or get in there. Now I'm taking the bicycle and I'm going to run it over with the car. But they didn't really run it over with the car. They would just make him go inside. He cried. They're going to run my car over. They're going to put it in the dumpster. But let me tell you something, man. I didn't get that type of exclusive discipline. And you know what? 
I remember going down there when I was about. Now, Jackie and I are around the same age, and I'm maybe two years older than Lafito and maybe four years or five years older than Gina. And when I went back down in age, Ofito was doing drugs, but the other two girls, not at all. And then my uncle went to jail, so they had to sell the house and the property and move to Atlanta. And while they were in Atlanta, that's when my mom died and I would keep in touch with them. And then I lost contact with them and recontacted with them in 84. And the one girl was already getting married, the other one was already in college. Do you think if the uncle hadn't gone to prison, you would have moved in with them when your mom passed away? Without a shadow of a doubt. That was already pre-planned. While my mother was alive, there was conversations about me moving down there. Because there was a school down there called Loyola. A private military school or some shit. And they had threatened me with that school. And Rodolfo always wanted me closer to him anyway because he always felt guilty about my dad dying. But when I was a kid, they were fucking strict with their kids. And let me tell you something. We used to go to restaurants and shit constantly because they had dough. So the, the old man would take us to seafood restaurants and shit, and those kids were well-behaved. And I was always well-behaved because my mom took me to restaurants and she would fucking smack the fuck out of me out of him if I embarrassed her. <laughs> But it's so amazing how I look back at the discipline they had and I look at how they turned out and it doesn't surprise me. And so Did I, they get beat the fuck up? No, they didn't. They got punished the old fashioned way. They got punished by writing out pay listen, when you got that punishment, you know that eight o'clock hour where you watch cartoons? Right. You would get up, eat breakfast, and at eight o'clock you had to be in the living room on the table, they had like a card table. And the card table was always set up year-round in a corner next to the piano. That was always there for anybody who fucked up. And you just sat there from 8 to 6 o'clock at night and just wrote, I will not disrespect Lee again. And the eyes had to be under the eyes. The wills had to be under the wills. The real not disrespect every the leaves had to be on the leaves and you wrote pages Lee so you wrote from 8 to 5 and then you took an hour break and then from 7 to fucking nap time you wrote again but she always gave you a break on the third day you know what three days of doing that is no you have no idea when she got super pissed she'd make you write it in English and in Spanish and then my mom picked that up from them. That's when my mom picked that up. When I got older, her and Juan would make me fucking write lines constantly. Fucking all day. All day. It's, uh... Raising children yeah. is fucking tough, man. And you have to make some wild decisions. Like, how, how would it make you feel? with like with your, Not with your friend or even when as a kid. Since you grew up with discipline, if you went over and saw one of your friends, like bag talking their parents, would it make you like, like it like freak you out a little bit? And you used to, you still like, what the hell is happening? I can make a joke about this, but I don't really remember who the family was. I'd like if I had to narrow it down, the first white kid I ever see disrespect his family was a kid by the name of Michael Olson from down in Union Turnpike. <coughs> they were Irish. And I've talked about this guy before because he's on Facebook now and he's very unique. Now he's got teeth. But when we were kids, he had been smoking from such a young age, from like 10 or 11. He had been smoking like he had eight or nine brothers. They were all Irish. They all had freckles. They all had red hair. And his teeth were so cavitated and so green and so unbrushed that he got cavities and he would put his cigarettes in the cavity and smoked a cigarette. But one time, you know, listen, man, you don't know what kids' houses are going to be like when you get invited over there. One time he called me up, and he's like, well, I don't know if he called me up. We got together, and he goes, you want to walk me to my house? And I went over to his house. Michael Olson lived off a of Union Turnpike next to a body mechanic shop where, where people towed cars and shit like that. He, his family lived there. They didn't have much money. They just had nine or ten kids. And I remember going in there and the mother talking to him and him saying shit to the mother. 
and my heart stopped. Yeah, it just stops. Oh my god. It's like, are you gonna die now? Like, that's just it. You're gonna be dead. My friend's gonna be dead. And they're just not. I'm almost positive it was the Olsons. He's on Facebook, he's got a hat on and shit hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> like a fucking, like a journeyman or some shit. <laughs> you have the one comment that just, like, could kill someone, but it's like, it, it, it just for them, like, the guy, he has a hat on. Like, he, he probably loves that hat. If he listens, he's like, what's wrong with the hat? <laughs> he talking about, oh, why, didn't, why doesn't Joey like the hat? But he's got, it's not like a normal baseball hat, it's like an Indiana Jones hat. Why would you put an Indiana fucking Jones hat on unless you're an explorer? <laughs> he must love fucking... it. It's his, it's his Facebook profile. Listen, I love a lot of things. I love the Clint Eastwood hat and in the, in the, in the, in the, the outlaw Josie Wales. That, that scene there, somebody shot him. But before that, with the hat, I love that hat. I can't wear that hat. First of all, I'm too, my head don't fit in those fucking things. I got a weird shaped head. My head doesn't fit in any hats. No, no. So from there on, that's it. But it's uh, as a parent, you're always trying to figure out how to discipline. And you learn how to discipline, how you got disciplined, you know. I never got cracked with a whip. I got cracked with hands, a couple of objects, a couple of elbows, you know, shit like that. I didn't even get that. I, I still remember the first time I saw a kid get, like, even just smacked in the back of the head. Like, I had never had seen it before. And this kid... I remember, like, it was, like, it was yesterday. It was my friend's house, and he had two older brothers, and... I don't even remember what the older brother did. I think he took like a thing of pudding from some, from the other brother, and the, the father just looked and gave him a quick in the back of the head, and I must have like looked like a deer in headlights, because I had never like the the only thing I remember about like the few spankings or th things I got is like it felt like the earth like the world slowed down, like it was in slow mo like that bong hit, and like it was. Just because it happened so so like infrequently and it wasn't it was just so weird but so the when you were saying about like throw the kid into the shower like that's where you're going to get some kickback these days well here's the deal you're not hitting the child you're putting the child in shock okay you you're taking the kid out of his comfort zone completely right he's never been dragged on the floor and he's never been thrown in a fucking cold shower before that's going to blow his circuitry right there. Especially when your mom does it or your dad who loves you. You know, who loves you. And now he explained himself to you before it happened. That's the key. You have to explain yourself, which nobody ever listens to, which this kid is not going to listen to. This is why this has to happen. This is why this has to happen. A lot of people at home listen to me going, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, it's tough to raise a child. Would I fucking throw my daughter in the shower if she wouldn't listen to me? Absolutely. Absolutely. A cold fucking shower and go, what the fuck is your problem? This is the deal here. This is the fucking deal in this house. This is how you have to behave yourself. This is how you have to act, you know. It's, uh, and it must be weird just, just from the, like, the fact, like, you, like, being over there tonight, I could never imagine being annoyed with Mercy in two seconds. Oh, yeah. She's going to get annoying at some age, and she's going to talk back to her mother, and she's going to come to me for fucking, you know, whatever leverage, and i got to be honest with her and explain to her that her mom is the fucking boss. That, you know, you have to... <laughs> if not, you lose the fucking battle, you know? So that I, I know the position I'm going to be. It's not like I don't know already. I, I don't see it played out. I see the, the hand in front of me. I'm pretty stern with it. You know, I am pretty stern with her, and I grab her, and I talk to her, and then I hug her, and I explain it. And sometimes she cries, and sometimes she gets it. She just gets up and runs away, and then comes back 10 minutes later, and we're right back where we started from. But I told her not to hit my nose. And you know what? Three of those days, she kissed my nose, and she didn't jump on top of me. She's not a bad kid, you know. But when she gets 10, there's going to be problems. When there's 6, there's problems. You know, there's always something... But you have to be there. That's the most important thing. Yeah, and, and, and teach them. Well, you know, something happened last week. Spoke, speaking about teaching, I've been dying to talk to you about this. This is why I'm, I'm happy the guest moved and it was us. Because I've always had a problem, especially when I was a kid. I always had a problem with people 
when we went out and did drugs. That was scared. Okay. So Friday night, we're here. We're fucking around. I'm still, I get the stitches out. You know, we've had this liquid acid for God knows how long. <laughs> Me and Leela, let's just do a little drop. It's now, I've been practicing with the CBD oil because the thing's expensive, so you can't just fucking take it like a savage. So it says seven drops, and you start counting the drops, you know. So if he tells me to take seven, I'm, I'm 300 pounds, I take 10. For the CBD, not for, for the, the liquid CBD. Acid. No, no. So <laughs> then we bumped into the guy at the Chinese restaurant. Yeah. And uh, one thing leads to another. And me and Leah are discussing this shit, and I take the one dropper out. And again, I tap this thing down to the least minimal, and I give it one to myself. And then I give one to Lee. Now, the one I gave to Lee was so small, but Lee moved and it hit his lip. So that counted as like a hat. Not even. I did, uh, I know what I looked at. I, in fact, if you ask Lee, I did it a couple times to see what a full drop was. And then I did it again, and I just played with it a little bit. You didn't I got, tell me that's what you're doing. But yeah, yeah. I, got, I, I tried to get the least amount in there to, for us just to try it out. Lee's never done it before. I haven't done it in years. We did the blot of that one time, but I just, I don't believe in excess the first time. And we saw the gentleman, and he told us not to fuck around. So this time, I go, Lee, ready for another one? Lee does a little one again. Again, I dabble with it. Boop, I get a little one in there. I don't know if we did one right away, or we waited a little while. I broke your balls. And then we did one. Okay, boom. We do the three little dabbles. Somewhere along the line, I felt... Uh, a little nausea, and I felt like my body shivering and stuff. But at one point in the podcast, I blew a smoke out. I blew smoke out out of a bong, and I saw how Lee looked at the smoke mm -hmm. for a minute. And I'm like, oh, fuck. We're going to have a problem here. So I thought the acid was going to kick in for me really good. The podcast ended. The guest left. Lee and I stayed here for another 35, 40 minutes talking. And I tell you what, the acid... Rattled my cage a little bit, but it wasn't like the '80s where I had to go home and drink orange juice and hide and put earphones on, and you have the sudden nurse to take a shower and scrub your toes and right. all this shit. Just to make to clarify, we did the first one before, and we right. didn't do the second one until after. Okay, so I, I knew because so that, we did like, three of them, right? Only I only did two. Okay, I thought we did three half drops, like real small drops. N maybe you did for me, but I thought I only did two. Okay, so. That was it. Lee and I have a conversation. I walk home. On the walk home, I feel weird, you know, when you take acid and once it's mixed with your heart and you start moving, now it's a different story. You might kick up the speed from you moving. The adrenaline kicks up the acid. Okay. And all of a sudden you're tripping. And, I, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, boy, I better start breathing out of my nose. Thank God they took the stitches out. <laughs> and I'm breathing out of my nose, breathing out of my nose. And finally, guess what, guys? Nothing happened. I go upstairs, I do my usual, I wash my hands, I take a piss, I wash my hands, I put, say hello to Demi, he's in the living room, I put the TV on, I get some water, I get the pipe, I get the lighter, I go outside, and when I finish fucking smoking a pipe right there, I'm like, I'm fucking starving. And I go on the thing, but there's more to the story. I'm sitting here afterward with, at the 40 minute mark, and I'm, I'm, I, I just have to go home, I'm tired, I gotta babysit Mercy at nine, and all of a sudden, Lee goes, boy, are you hot? First off, I see him get up by himself, and he turns off the red and blue lights in the studio. So I'm watching all this, and I'm like, this kid's fucked up. But I'm not fucked up. So I took the same amount as Lee. I think Lee took a little less than me because one drop fell on his thing, and I go, Lee, put it back in your, on your tongue. So whatever, I'm not accusing you of anything, Lee. I'm just saying that at that point, I felt guilty because I'm like, when is this going to kick in? All right, Lee has done two things so far that showed me that he could be seeing something. When he looked at the smoke and when he asked me if it was hot in here. That's never a good sign when somebody asks you if it's hot in here. So I open the door and then he says to me, boy, it's so hot in here, I got to take my shoes off. Not only does he take his fucking shoes off, but he takes his socks off <laughs> like it's the 60s in here. And he's like, boy, I feel better. Once your feet are hot, that means you're tripping. But again, I'm sitting here, guys, and to my fucking God is my witness. I'm not fucking feeling nothing. I'm feeling the reefer. Did we eat any stars? No. We had no fucking stars. That's why we took the acid.
we smoked a lot of bong hits. We smoked a lot of fucking bong hits. Speaking of which, it's time for another bong hit. Oh, Jesus. It's your birthday bong hit. So, uh, I, I didn't think nothing of it. I go, he can't be this fucking high. Maybe he's playing with me. But then he says something else to me. He goes, dog, it's still fucking hot in here. <laughs> and I go, well, then, I don't know what to tell you. And he's moving the table. And I'm going, why are you moving the table? He goes, I'm thinking I'm laying down over here. Didn't you lay down on the couch for a minute? Yeah. He laid down on the couch. I'm like, oh, no. But again, I'm not tripping, so I'm tired. I go home. Again, I told you motherfuckers. I go home. I put the TV on. I drink some water. I call him back to check up on him. And now he tells me he's got his shirt off, which to me is hysterical. <laughs> right? He's got his shirt off. He's got his shoes off, his socks off. He's in the office here, and God knows what he's thinking about. Were you tripping at that point? Okay, so here's the thing. What do you mean tripping? Were you seeing things? Were you hearing voices? No, I've never... The most I've ever tripped was on one of those times with the blotter. And, um, like, my keyboard, the keys started floating away. But I didn't trip like that this time. What you said at the beginning about people with fear... At that point, what well, for me was fear, because it's uh, it like I'm not like what I kept thinking was like I'm not supposed to be doing this. Like I'm a kid that, who grew up in suburbia. Didn't I tell you you were thinking that? You, you told you you kept telling me that I wasn't thinking that at, at the point. But I'm then like you're when you left, thinking fucking. I went to Emerson. Not even that. I got good friends. I got a degree. Why am I fucking doing acid with this fat fucking loser? Not even that. Just acid. And then I was actually a little annoyed with you that you left. I was like, Right. I remember because nothing was happening for me. I'm like, and I I can't risk taking another one and being up all night and then having mercy at 8 o'clock in the fucking morning yelling in my face. I mean, I could take care of anybody. But I couldn't risk taking another one. I didn't want to give you another one. No, and the, but there was nothing for you to do here. Like, that was the thing. There was nothing you were going to do. And I realized all this later. And I don't know, with you, does acid get you energetic? Is it like an upper? Oh, it fucking picks everything up. Okay, because, yeah, I'm, I'm, I always walk around like a crazy person. I'm picking things up. I'm putting it down. <laughs> it's really, I start organizing. I've organized. <coughs> when he talked to me, and when he spoke to me, and he told me that he had his shirt off. I got a little scared from <laughs> I stayed up a little while longer. Uh. Now, I called back. <laughs> and by this time, he's telling me this fucking story about that he got an Uber and a Mexican gangbanger showed up with a fucking crucifix on the dashboard listening to Spanish music. It was supposed to be a 2007. What did he show up with? 97. A 1997. Easily. And it Easily. Was, it was like he was, he was creeping up the road like going like probably had his foot on the brake he had music going and it was just it was the kind of leather where it really wasn't connected to the seat uh, whatever it was anymore it was just kind of loosely there and I just got in and I like I shouldn't have gotten in but as soon as I kind of was like this is not cool man and then I had already put my address in because I didn't want I didn't want to talk to anybody I was like okay I'll just put my address in I'll go home but then he's like and then he kept asking me things, but in he Spanish, just, he, pretty much, man. He didn't speak English. I mean, I I, f- I felt racist at the man- moment, man. Like especially with acid, it makes you feel really like shitty about like bad things in your life. So I felt racist, but I was like, man, I need you need to at least be able to speak English like a little bit, like, and and like I just didn't feel comfortable with him knowing where I lived. Like it was just I didn't feel it, it just. I'm not a very streetwise person, I don't think. I didn't Well, that was the acid, and you're also making you ultra paranoid. Right, a little bit paranoid, but oh, I Oh, but I could just imagine when you were at. When you got into the car, oh. it was like a scene from a fucking movie. Oh, my God. So this happens. He gets in the fucking car and goes back to the train station. Yeah, I have him take two lefts and take me back to the train. Then he gets attacked by a fucking hooker with a fur jacket on or something like that. What happened there? Oh, there? I So he let me off of the train, and there was this, like, wild pack of, like... The, you know the Warriors? It was like the black version of the Warriors. But they were just running around, the, and they were trying to find a street. And, like, half of the group wanted to go one way. Half the group wanted to go the other way. And then I kept... I was just walking up a dirt path. And I was going to call another Uber. But I was like... First of all, I didn't want him to get the call. And I also didn't... I just didn't feel safe. So I was just walking in this, like, dirt path next to the train. And this, like... 
in my head was a hooker. She it could not have been, but in my head she was wearing like a big fur coat, had like a big furry like something in front of her, like a uh, like a big furry box or something. It was really weird. Did she say something to you? No, she like I was, you know, I was very, I was very nervous that she was gonna be like want to party or whatever hookers say and I was like I don't want to talk to anybody right now and but you just walked back to the office I just walked back to the office now when you got home what happened now what time is it you did the acid here at 7 o'clock 7.30 right what time was it when you got home probably close to 1 o'clock I and think. what were you feeling at that point still nervous and real real uh, energetic I was I was going around my house cleaning but I would only clean, like, one thing. Like, I would clean, like, one dish and then go clean something in the bedroom. I will just keep, I would bounce around my apartment. And... No I, voices, no music. No. No nothing. I, this was I just speed to, catching up you up. Oh, yeah. I, I listened to some podcasts, I think, for a little bit. And I, I tried to watch TV, but TV's always weird. The, the face is always... That's where I hallucinate. With With TV. <laughs> It's weird. The faces kind of get jumbled up. And, like, the, the, it always seems brighter. The, the contrast seems off. And when you're seeing this, what are you thinking about all this? It just, it just, at the, when it, with, with TV, it reminds me that I'm fucked up. I'm like, oh, shit, I'm fucked up. Because when I'm nervous, I just try to convince myself I'm not that fucked up. I'm like, you'll be okay. You're not that fucked up. You're okay. You're okay. It's getting better. It's getting better. Now, it's what getting... time did you leave the house? Okay. Well, it, it was, it got better around, like, 3 between like three and four because here's okay just to be completely honest i tried to 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 rub one out for like an hour and a half like it just wouldn't had dead dick nothing yeah, completely nothing your heart's beating yeah because i was trying to, to sweat and it's a horror show i was trying to go to bed and when i couldn't go to bed i was like fuck i'll, I'll stay up and clean and i started ha i started to get less nervous like i think it calmed me down like it just got my brain off of it for a while and I started having, like, really cool thoughts. I don't know. It was just, like, I just started, like... And I even said at one point, I was like, this is why you do it. Because it's... I, I always ask you, like, when, at the end of the podcast, when at, like when we're 17 bong hits in and 1,000 milligrams, I'm like, why are you still doing this? And, like, that's why... I, like, in my head, I'm, like, mad at you throughout the night. I'm like, this motherfucker give me ass. It left me alone. And now I'm freaking out. And I'm not sleeping. And then I was like, oh, because you have these cool, like when you when you when you actually stop freaking out, you can have some really interesting conversations with yourself. And that's why I'm not really, and I've said it before, music for me I think would have taken me out of it. I like silence, especially with that sort of stuff. So I was just walking around cleaning, and I would just think about certain things, and and I, <laughs> for anyone watching live. I decided to shave my beard at like seven in the morning and I shaved my head again but at like six o'clock is when I decided to leave I was trying I was trying to go to bed again and I couldn't sleep and I was like I need to go get some things so I might as well just go to the store 24 hours and it was great it was great I had so much fun like it was at a point where I could totally handle and it you were up all night not, not a wink of sleep. And you felt great. Felt really energized. and I felt So what it was, it was a, it hit you with a low dose, you know, because you did feel weird and you did stay up and you did have dead dick. Right, yeah. It was just a low dose and a hallucinogenic or you would just, next time we do it, we just take one big drop and run with it and stay here for a while and see how it feels. I, uh, I'm sorry I left you. I just no, thought... No. But that, no, 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 and I don't listen. I've been left. I, I part of me when we spoke the next morning, and you said to me you had a good time. I was going somewhere. Oh, I had mercy, but for the rest of the day, I thought about our conversation. That a you weren't mad, and b you looked at it from a perspective from somewhere else. You started telling me that next time you wish you had a notebook. I hadn't said nothing to you about it, and then you said to me, "Now I know why you do this. It's been weird." The last time I did it with was with you and Ari. And then before that, God knows when I did it before. Oh, I did it with Ari for Pink Floyd. And that was garbage. It was okay, but it was, wasn't, 
It was three hour. Did I appreciate it? Yeah. The we did it in the office one night, you and I, without Ari, because right. we did it twice. Yeah. That night too. I was high till two, two thirty, and by three thirty I was in bed. I appreciated that. You know, first off, I'm a bigger guy. Number two, my tolerance is off the fucking chains. <laughs> it's even off the chains for the Oxycontins they gave me at the hospital. I had to call Talking Land, go Talking Land. This ain't doing nothing to me. Nothing. He goes, chew him, but that, nothing. Then one night I woke up twice with my fucking wrist hurting. I had 75 milligrams of that shit in me. So there's a lot of shit that don't do nothing to me. And so don't take it bad. It just doesn't. It's been years. Oh, no, I don't I, know. So, I have no... Acid tolerance. I'm going to say, say something now, and I'm going to get it out of the way with a lot of people, okay? <clears throat> I get busted. My balls get busted all the time because people send me, what am I going to do, DMT? Number one, look at my fucking face. Do I look like I need DMT? And number two, I'm too old. Number three, let me tell you why I didn't believe in DMT and none of the properties. Just to break myself down so people don't think I'm a fucking asshole. When uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was watching that Black Mass with B Rusty Bulger, and there's one scene, whatever his name is, Whitey <laughs> Bulger, and there's one scene where the guy is selling Whitey Bulger to the feds, and they say that he's a psychopath, not to mention that he did experimentation with acid, and the cop goes, yeah, five or six times, and the other cop goes, how about 50 times? And they all looked at each other like he was Charles fucking Manson. If I tell you something, I'm going to tell you guys a, a reaping discovery, okay? I didn't get into acid till the summer of my sophomore year. Like June of 78, after I hit the number, I used to run with this guy Lefty, and one night he gave me a hit of Microdot. And that shit had me going for fucking 18 hours, Lee. First couple times you did that shit, that rat poison that's in it, that shit keeps you up for fucking days. But since you're in training from the stars, thank to me that I'm a good nutrition, THC, whatever, and I watch coach. your fucking coach, mm -hmm. uh, you don't, you didn't freak out. Number one, you weren't scared. Well, I which, was at which, the beginning. Which helped. But let me tell you guys what happened. So that summer of 70 fucking 8, I get into microdot acid, blotter acid. It's, it, we didn't know what we were getting until Saturday. Everybody always had microdot acid, but we were getting it. We get other shit, whatever the people were gonna make, whether it was microdot or, or four-way acid. Our town was flooded with it. There was like three or different neighborhoods that sold that shit in North Bergen. You know, I got hooked on it until one day I started selling it. I started going to East Stroudsburg, and I've told this story a thousand of times, and I became a business guy with this shit, and it's so weird that I started eating it since I was never a drinker, guys. My excuse for not drinking, like, you can't fucking drink and do acid. Like, I didn't like it at all because I like the acid high so much with the marijuana. But, go ahead. Oh, no, because I was going to talk about that. I didn't, I, I messed up. You kept asking me if I had weed at the house, and I, I didn't think about it. I actually had some stars and some capsules, so I took it around, like, three or two or three, I think, and I think that might be what calmed me down. Yeah, that takes a little edge off, absolutely, which is smart. That's the way I've always given it to you. Every time we've had the mushrooms, it's with the chocolate with the fucking edible. Remember the edible, the, the mushroom chocolate edible we had? It was chocolate with edibles in it yeah. wrapped around a mushroom, mm -hmm. and it's always a little better than you said to me. Next time I'll do it without the fucking edible. I'll just do it with the uh, mushroom, and then I brought the mushrooms into the studio. So my point being that it was really weird when... My mom died, and I would go home at night. I, I can't lie to you guys. I did acid maybe five nights a week for fucking eight or nine months. And then there was like another year where I did it maybe three nights a week. Because I had eaten it so much, I built such a fucking tolerance by the age of 16. Eating that microdot. I would eat three of them when you would eat one of them. Oh, my gosh. That's, that's crazy. But one thing I got to be honest with you, Lee, that you were honest with me about that, you know what, man? Every time I got high on that shit, I took something positive of it. Absolutely. I always, I took something positive from it. If there was something that was bothering me deep down inside or something that had me all jammed up, I'd dedicate that hit of acid to that thought. And I'd break, I'd, I'd go home. I couldn't wait to be alone. 
because you can't go there with other people in the room. With other people in the room, it takes the acid somewhere else. You start talking about look at the car, look at the lights, look at the steam from the fucking car, you know, look at the... But if you're in somebody's house, you're watching a movie, you're freaking out other people's faces. It's when you get home and your surrounding environments that that acid goes to work. See, when you do DMT, you're high for eight, nine minutes, and then there's like a fucking three or four hour after whatever, but the original warmth and the original patois is a 10 minute tops type of thing. With the acid, it comes and goes, and you have more time to spend with that warmth. I don't know, it's so tough to, to, under, to make people understand that. When I first heard what DMT was, I got it. I'm not putting it down from that perspective. I'm just putting it from a perspective that there's not much you can get from it. I'll give you a hit of acid where you trip for 12 hours, like when those guys go down to Peru and they eat that shit and they see the devil and shit. It's an eight, 12 hour thing because then it really breaks you down. If you came to me tomorrow and said, you know what, Joey, I, I, I love doing the podcast with you. I love eating fucking cake and donuts that Becky brings. But we know it's bothering me lately. I'm going to go to law school. I love Paula. I'm Jewish. The fuck am I doing the podcast business? Let me become an attorney and I'll become a podcast attorney. You come to me one day and go, let me get the rest of that acid. And you probably eat it by yourself and rent the hotel room in North Hollywood, one of those fucking shitty hotel rooms. Take two joints with you, order a pizza, and just sit there for eight hours and just think it over. That's what I used to do at that age, guys. I didn't take no ADD pill or Adderall's or no... I didn't take none of that stuff. I took microdot fucking acid to make me focus on whatever I was going through. So I wouldn't, like, you know, for a year I took acid at that age just trying to figure out why God would take somebody's mother. Do you know how deep of a thought that is? No. But in it... But did it freak you out, or did you, were you able to like just to talk yourself through it? Because it didn't. It's, it's an hour of crying. It's an hour of laughing. It's an hour of hope that you give yourself in that eight-hour tripping. Remember, you take it at eight o'clock at night. You start tripping at nine thirty. Okay. You're with your friends till twelve. You walk home. By the time you walk home, it's a quarter to one. You go in your house. You piss. You drink some water. You already smoked outside. Now, when you sit out in the dark, you can actually feel it creeping on you. Once you're by yourself and there's no other energies in the room to take that energy away from you, you'll feel that acid creeping on you. Lee. And if you're dark, all of a sudden, once that acid taps into your breathing, once you start seeing the bottom of your eyes, you're, you're hallucinating. Your eyes are wide open, right? It's catching fucking stimulation from everywhere. Now, once the bottom of your eye sees your stomach breathing heavy, that's when that fucking party starts. That's when that fucking party starts, Lee. And now you have to start breathing easier. You have to break out a joint. Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe eat a star and just sit and relax. And maybe get a piece of paper and pencil and close your eyes and lay down. Don't try to go to sleep. But don't try to do more. I get sitting down, but I I do my best thinking. Even... Even now, when I'm like, I'll I'll walk and pace around my apartment like a crazy person. So I I I would try to sit down. That night, and I look at me. I never I never have a problem laying down. I was I was up the whole night, taking showers, cleaning. I don't know. It's fun. I liked it. Yeah, me too. There was a period where I took acid just for that. Towards the end, I liked taking acid outside. I can't tell you. Uh, how many nights I went out when I was 16 and 17 and took hits of microdot and tripped our balls off walking the streets in alleys in the back ends of North Bergen between Ken Oh my God, I can't fucking tell you how many nights just walking uphill on acid. Your heart's pumping up a storm. You're fucking stopping to get air and you trip and you all stand there for seven minutes. Then you all look at each other and go, did you see that? Yeah. Come on, let's go. You walk 10 more minutes, and then you'd cease, and then somebody would have to stop to breathe. 
it was just a, I'm happy that you looked at it from that experience. I was happy that you weren't mad at me, which no. I know you were for leaving you alone. But in the back of my mind, I left you alone so you could see what the fuck it really was. By the time I called you the next morning, I wasn't mad. I and I was happy that you weren't fearful. It's so many people who have to go home and look it up on the website now. Nothing pisses me the fuck off mm -hmm. when I give somebody to somebody, when I give you a present, like a TNC <laughs> present or something. And people gotta give me some bullshit story that they got to go home and look it up online or something. I wouldn't give it to you to poison you. Yeah. I give it to you because I love you. I give it to you because I want you to get to see the fucking devil. You would give it to someone to poison them. Well, no, I would never give somebody. I would never be in business to poison somebody. But that shit always fucking pisses me off. It always pisses me off when people call me and say, "Hey, man." Uh, I'm thinking of doing mushrooms with my friends. How many do you think I should eat? You know, I went online. What are you fucking talking about? This friend, how long have you been friends with him? Since grammar school. There's no trust. If he tells you to eat three stems, eat fucking three stems. First off, if you freak out, you with friends. I would tell Lee. Lee, listen, this is the first time I did mushrooms. So let's just do them tonight here. And don't tell nobody. <laughs> and it's just me and you. And then I would do them. And I call you a week later and go, all right, you sure I won't feel creepy if I do this? And you'll go, no. And we'll go down to a bar and do the fucking mushrooms or the acid. Do you follow me? I would milk you through it slowly. I would never, the first time you did acid the other night, would I take you and take you to the comedy store. Right. You would have a nervous breakdown. Oh, yeah. On Sunset, you would have a fucking nervous breakdown. That would not have been fun. Let me give some shout-outs right here. My main man, Jay Rama, putting the pieces together. Always emailing me, telling me, letting me know he's doing better and better. Rob Keys, my man holding it down in Chicago. Bob Lalingus, Jordan Hutchinson, John Cutler, Chris O'Hara, Hort Stepper. My family down in motherfucking Austin waiting for us. Lee's coming down 10 pounds slimmer. He wants to come down 10 pounds lighter. He wants to leave 20 pounds heavy. You know yeah, what I'm saying? that's a good plan. So fuck it. We're going down to Austin <laughs> soon. We'll be in fucking Denver. We'll be in motherfucking Oklahoma at the Cherokee Nations Casino. Stop it. World tour that starts in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Who else starts their fucking tour in Oklahoma? You know anybody else? Who has that type of fucking... Not even Trump opened up his American tour in fucking Oklahoma. And I'm flying at... Are you fucking kidding me or what? Then we go to Denver. Then we go on the Oddball Fest. West Palm, bam. Motherfucking Tampa, bam. Motherfucking Atlanta, bam. Motherfucking Indianapolis, bam. And then back home. Then I'm off for a few weeks. Then the next week... It's me and my fucking main Jewish goomba taking it live to Austin, Texas, Lisa. I can't wait. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be so much fun. All right, Coxsack. But did, I have the question that everyone wants to know. What is it? Were you considered for Trump's VP? Stop bothering me, right? <laughs> fucking questions. Trump's VP. I don't even know who he picked. Mike Pence. He's the governor of New York. Again, I don't know who the fuck he picked. I'm sorry about the bottle, people. Again, I don't know who the fuck he picked. Nor do I care, at least I had. So that's it. This is your fucking 28th birthday. Yeah, it's been great. We have donuts. Well, I mean, it's, uh, to be honest, it's getting a little scary. It's getting real close to 30, which I know a lot of people make think I'm still a baby, but that's like real adult to me. I got good news for you, and I got bad news for you. Okay. Can you became me? an adult when you were 16. Okay? You became a fucking adult when you were 16. You were working at a movie theater. You were driving a car, you know, that your parents gave you, but you had to pay for I insurance. I paid for it. I know you did. You know, some fucking car. What type of car was it? 97 Chevy Cavalier. Stop it. A Cavalier. I Rally to, Sport Edition. Let me tell you something. I used to have this teacher, the Camel, <laughs> and he used to have a, a fucking car that was a Cavalier. So when you called to place the bet, that was his code name, the Great Cavalier. Stop. Who the fuck you think you're dealing with this shit? So you become a fucking adult. You know what happened to me when I was 28? Let me tell you what happened to me when I was 28. What happened to you? 
I got into comedy and I got divorced. That's crazy. That is crazy. And everything I thought where my life was going changed completely. Within six months, I went from having a family to having nothing and no job. And the only thing at that point in my life was, uh, because if we consider my whole 28th year, I got into comedy in June of 91. That's when I was 28. Okay. And I got separated in October of 91. So two of the biggest achievements, you know, two of the most fucked up things in my life that happened, happened to me when I was 28. You know, it's not about age, man. I'm 53. I'm sitting next to a 28-year-old doing a fucking podcast. It's not about age at all. And if you grab, every time I thought about fucking AIDS, I would end up snorting two fucking eight balls. Because I thought, too, the clock was running out. Yeah. Guess what? The clock runs out when you decide it runs out. You know, that's the truth. The clock runs out. Who knows what's going to happen? I wish you all the luck in the world. Paul is moving in. You're, uh, you know, you know, you when you're 28, 29, 30, you have to be scared. If you're not scared, there's got to be something wrong with you. Like, no, you know, you, you know, unless you have a ceiling over you and you're getting a guaranteed fucking check every week, should you, you know, we live off every month. We don't know what's going to happen, Lee. Every month there's a zero here on the first until the smoke clears. We don't know nothing. Right. And I don't mind that. That doesn't... We don't know nothing, so it's kind of weird how, <sighs> let me tell you something, at 28, you had a lot more going for you than I did, so let's just start there. I mean, complete two worlds. You had a degree, you have a family, you have a girlfriend that loves you, you have um, a little money put away, you have your own apartment at 28. Once she left, oh my God, I was completely lost. I didn't know what to do. I was barely hanging on. I went from having a little money in the bank to having nothing to my world shattering. But I kept it together with comedy little by little. Those were my little fucking band-aids. That's you know? pretty much my nightmare. Like, I don't know how people like... Like that was something that freaked me out on the acid. There was this dude... Like this, like young dude, who was like just drunk and like really sick outside of the CVS. And I was like, God, that could have been me. Like, ha why is he? Why is he like? You want to bong him? Rather birthday bong him before the show is over? Sure, why not? <laughs> oh my God! What did he show? Uh, what's the problem here? There's no problem. Let's do a birthday bong it. People turned in. It's a late night, you know what I'm saying? It's your 28th birthday. I wish you nothing but luck. Some people blow smoke up your ass and they bring you some shit. I bring you the best reefer in town and a fucking... and a good fucking thought. That's how we celebrate the fucking birthday. Well, thank you, man. Over here at the church of what's happening now. And what better way? The Indians, what? They cut the skin off their finger and you merge fingers. You were blood brothers. I faint. In my world, we can't make that happen. But the only thing we can both do is a bong hit a fucking death here. And here you go. We'll pack a light one for you. Come over here with your Uncle Joey. Oh, here. you're not going first? No, no, I did it already. I did like two of them over here like a fucking uh, orphan. And you're sitting there on your birthday. You have the bong of the week on fucking Instagram. Nobody fucking... What are you going to do? You're going to sit there like a monkey? I'm coming, I'm coming. Hurry up. The fucking... The clock is ticking. We got to get out of here. Where are you going with the keyboard? Leave the keyboard. Oh, no. You, you got to control the cameras? Yeah. All right. Take your time, but hurry up. Come on. Let's do this, cocksucker. 
Look at you, the birthday boy. What are you doing tomorrow night for your birthday? Tomorrow night, um, Paula's coming over. She, actually, I have no idea how this sounds, but. Just put the fucking she, thing on here. She, um, I'll tell the, uh, we're going in the food trucks, and we're just going to hang out. All right, hurry up with the bong here. You're killing me. Come on, leave the okay. chair alone. Okay. Let's go. Let's do this. Fucking happy birthday. What the fuck? I was singing for you, but we already did it early. Grab the bottle. I have to lie to you. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you said it. Shoot that motherfucker. Go, 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 go. Suck it, suck it. Suck it, cocksucker. Suck it, cocksucker. Pop that lid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why is it so funny? <laughs> <laughs> oh, happy birthday, cocksucker. I wish, somebody, I wish somebody gave me a bung like that when I was 20. <laughs> Nobody gave me dick and shit, cocksuckers. Mm. And that's it. This uh, Thursday night, I'm over here at Flappers <laughs> tomorrow night. It's the No Expectations Tour, the first night. I'm even going to bring a notebook up on stage. I've never done that before, but I'm going to make sure I run the hour just to see what the fuck it sounds like. You people might take the ride. You might not take the fucking ride. What are you going to do? We all fucking uh, do okay. We look at each other and we shake hands. Lee will be there as the Captain Kirk of the Enterprise running the DJ board and shit. Doing bong, it's like a motherfucker. Happy birthday, buddy. Thank you, man. You didn't finish this bong. <clears throat> What's going on here? What is this? You can't be a man I'm with I'm a good birthday foot. boy. I share my gifts. Mm. Now mm. I gotta blow it out over here because it's not. <laughs> but now I gotta finish this thing. Look at that. You left a bunch of weed in here. you lucky I love you. Uh. If this was fucking at different times, I'd have you stabbed. <laughs> A little hard. Oh shit! What do you think of that, Lisa? Huh? Who the fuck you think you're dealing with? <laughs> fuck you, cocksucker! Happy birthday, dog. I'm happy, uh, and that's it. That's all I gotta fucking tell you. We gotta get the fuck out of here. We gotta go do spots and shit to do, and people to see. The acid was interesting. Because of your reaction, because of uh, you said you wanted to do it again, yeah, and, and this I... time you would have a fucking notebook, and I was blown the fuck away because everybody's so fucking scared today of doing anything. People will tell me after fucking when I get back with it, they'll go, "Why did you, why did you bring that back? Aren't you scared?" No, no, people are not gonna give you fucking poison. <laughs> I know the look on people's eyes when they give you fucking poison, dog. Okay. I know the reaction. I know how people sometimes act creepy. I'll fucking throw this shit away. But if somebody comes to me and they ask me how Lee is doing or that this is going to put a, uh, uh, this is going to make Lee lose his fucking mind, I'll come over here and do it. Do you know how many fucking different places I bought drugs in for the last 30 years? Two or think, three? Huh? Just two or three? Do you know? It's just a fear that, well, I don't know if it's your, I, and I'm not insulting you. I don't know if it's your generation guy. Because my wife is the same way. My wife and I had a discussion the other day in the living room about four in the morning. I got up and she came outside and we were talking about how the fuck. And I said something. Can you imagine? Do you remember that night you drove me to the Martel Cartel to get Coke? And you didn't really know, but you know, at four in the morning I left you in the car and I was in there for 15 minutes. And she goes, I remember sitting out there thinking, I should just leave this guy now, go home, pack my bags, and leave. But she goes, I didn't know how it was going to play out. I go, look how it did play out. You ended up with a beautiful child. We ended up married. We're happy, you know. So at this point somewhere, you have to believe that there is some type of God out there. Because I'll never forget that night, her waiting outside. And I've never done that to anybody like I've never, ever made somebody drive me like that over there. I've usually been the one that's driven or we're both that fucking high. She was just, I was walking out the door to fucking walk there. And she was pulling up 
she usually pulled in the fucking back by the garage. And it was like fucking three in the morning. And she goes, where are you going to go? And I go, I got to stop by Dante's. And she goes, okay, I'll give you a ride. And I never forget how bad I felt. But life goes on. See, you never know where your fucking relationship is going to go. That's it. I don't even know why the fuck I told you that, Lisa. Yeah. Just don't be scared. Somebody offers you something. If you love them to death and you've known them for 15 fucking years, wait, then they're going to do something, give you something fucking bad. But, you know, these fucking humps out here don't take nothing from nobody, so fuck them. What is your problem, Lee? Thousand milligrams. That's how deep you went tonight, Lisa. Yeah. Yes, sir. We're in deep training. <clears throat> Look at me. I'm in deep training, Lisa. Yeah. My balls are bleeding. <clears throat> That's Mine when, too. That's when you know you're fucked up. Where are you headed tonight? For the fight. You're not going to a strip club. You're not going to get your balls licked from a hand no. job at a Chinese place. Nothing. Tonight I'm going home to bed. All like right. A gentleman. <laughs> no, but it's, um, I were, what I would tell people is honestly, Tate, do it twice. Because, like, if you can do what I did and, like, come, because people are going to be scared, man. It's, 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 it's they, 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 they keep hammering into us how bad drugs are. And that's all we ever hear is don't do drugs, don't do drugs. And it's acid and, and I, it's it, it, it tastes weird. Nobody fucking, when you came to California, Lee, you never thought that you would be doing a fucking hit of acid at your job. Never. Okay, Lee? <laughs> but let me explain something to you, Lee. Sometimes, do you think that when I woke up one day, <coughs> I aspired to take a hit of acid or I aspired to do heroin, I aspired to do blow? No, I never aspired. You think when I was... At, at fucking five star basketball camp, playing with basketball players, I'm thinking there about going home and doing blow. It was the farthest thing from my fucking mind. But at some point in my life, there was a weakness, and the opportunity fucking presented itself. Where I came from, it's not like you can go, yeah, let me take that hit of mescaline, and I'll take it next week by myself. No, you're here right now. Take the fucking thing right now. Somebody gave you a quail, either you said yes or no. That time I went to Gunther's house and I did the line of heroin. Let me tell you something. When I walked in there, that was the farthest thing from my imagination, Lisa, I had, was to do that line of heroin. I swear to fucking God. So why'd you do it? Because really, at that point in my life, who gave a fuck? <sighs> it's heroin, though. At that point, I was so far fucking gone, and I wanted to be gone, Lee. That's the truth, that I just did it. It was a little line. I knew it wasn't going to kill me. I knew I knew that from hearing stories that I wasn't going to do a line like you do a cocaine line. This was a very tiny white line, and I even took some off it just to double, just to do a taste, just to make sure, and then I did the other little centimeter of dust and that was it I just wanted to fucking not be scared of it I think I don't know it's not like I went and got high the next fucking day you follow me you know what I'm a uh, I tend to like this stuff I have an addictive personality so I'm glad I'm scared of that stuff like I've, I've only even seen cocaine like once and it, like it was just for like a second like, I'm worried, like, if I did that, I'd be doing it. Like, like, no, 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 it's not. It doesn't fit you. If you, it just doesn't fit you. I would never want that shit around you. You know, uh, I bust your balls and tell you about heroin. I would never bring heroin around you. Oh, I know. I would never bring nothing around you, number one, that I would never do. I would never bring meth in here. I would never been blowing here. I wouldn't bring nothing like that in this studio. The worst thing I would bring in here is, like, a 2,000 milligram star. Which, worst case scenario, we go to the hospital, like, whatever that girl, they give you some tranquilizers and you spend the night in there, you sleep the night. Then mm -hmm. Obamacare takes care of the rest, you know what I'm saying? You put it on the arm with Obamacare. What do you want me to pay a month? Fuck it. Sometimes you eat an edible and you need a fucking night in a hotel room, you know what I'm saying? A hospital room. Right or wrong? That's the worst <laughs> thing that's going to happen to you. We don't drink in here, really. I'd love to get a few bottles of booze in here, but I know they're just sitting here. They yeah. were just sitting here. We, I'm yeah. not going to drink it. This, we never drink. It gives me fucking agenda and gives me fucking desires that I don't need to understand. You follow me? Give me the fucking scripts and let's get the fuck out of here, Lisa. Yeah. It's been a great week, motherfuckers. That's it. This shit's cracking.
It's July, what is it, 20th already? Yeah. Jesus Christ. That's it. The sum is fucking half gone. So yesterday, I go over to this place, guys. Pretty fucking impressive. You go to Indochino.com, all right? And you click on location, all right? And let's say you're a man, whatever, and you're looking for suits. Let me tell you what happened. So you click on location, and all of a sudden you press in Texas, and let's say you live in an hour out of out of Houston, you press. It's all of a sudden it comes out Galleria Mall in Houston, and and then it has. Do you want to make an appointment? And you click that, and all of a sudden it says, uh, "When is the appointment?" Ba 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 ba. You make it what time, and they said appointment set. Then you get a fucking email at your house, and that's it. You go down there, you park, you walk in, and you know me, dog. I'm trying to look for a fucking complaint. I get there, there's parking 10 feet away. I walk in, I tell the lady what my name is. I'm sorry, I'm three minutes late. She goes, Don't worry about it. Everybody's been fucked up here with this traffic. I'm real shit, whatever. Boom, I sit down. She asked me 14 questions, 15 questions. You know me, I don't like questions, but I didn't get pissed off either. And then um, and then uh, she asked me to look at the fabric. Then she asked me to look at the mannequins with the suits on and see what I wanted. Whether I wanted two buttons, whether I wanted the same color on the back of the collar. Just little things that you never fucking think of. That now you have a choice put in there or not. The design for inside the suit, for the lining. Just cool little shit. Then for another five minutes, they put they take three pictures of you, what you look like. I want them looking like a fucking thing with each with jeans and sneakers. I didn't know. I was in Beverly fucking Hills, people with white people, real white people. <laughs> they take a couple pictures of me, and then they fucking ask me a couple more questions. Boom. Twenty five minutes later, I'm out of there. I got a suit in five fucking weeks. You understand me? And you get to pick your own fucking fab. Anyway. Let me explain what happened. Uh, that's how they do it. You know, listen, uh, Indochina is reinventing men's fashion. And it's to measure suit is the best suit you will ever own. So suit up. Get one-of-a-kind made-to-measure suits. Customize the details you want. Pick your lining, lapel, personal fucking monogram, and more. There's 14 unique carat measurements going into making a suit that fits you perfectly. You can't go wrong with the well-crafted 100% merino wool suit. Also, check out their made-to-measure dress shirts and men's accessories. And guess what? There's a money-back guarantee, okay? Once you put these fucking suits on, like I put one of the suits on, you gotta feel what this fucking feels like. I don't know what the price is. I don't give a fuck. I know if you're a young guy and you're in the move, what's up, Lee? It's three ninety nine. Three fucking ninety nine. I don't give a fuck if you're a young man or you're on the move or what the fuck you're doing. Do me a favor, right? And go to get any premium suit for just three hundred and ninety nine dollars. That's up to fifty percent off. Indochina.com when entering fucking church at the checkout. Plus, shipping is free. There's no reason not to try your first custom-made suit with a deal this good, okay? All your life, you're like, I'm buying three suits for 200 like Lee would. You know, I do it too all the fucking time. And sometimes I go down there and I pay 300 I know it's the same suit they give me for three for 200 They're fucking thieves down there. It doesn't fucking matter. You even see it on a label. It don't matter. You see it. When you go buy the $300 suit, they'll take it to the same area and go, oh, no, 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 this is a better area. No, it's not. This is a custom fucking made suit. When was the last time you had a custom made suit for $399? Listen, go down there. Go to the website. Look at the instructions I told you. It's going to blow your mind because I guess this is the fucking future. Again, go to Indochina.com. Indochino, right? In, Indochino.com. What's the fucking promo code? Church. Church! C-H-U-R-C-H. <laughs> and you get any premium suit. For three hundred and ninety nine dollars, check this shit out. If you, if you just go right down the mall, next time you're fucking in the mall and they got an Indochino spot, go in there. Look at the fucking action. You're gonna die. All right, number two, one of the best fucking products I love. This shit I love because it works. It's effective, and it's fucking. You know, everybody comes home from work. You're tired. You don't want to go to the grocery store. What do you do? You go to blueapron.com. Okay. 
and your fucking life changes. You said to me, Joey, let me get that water over there. You said, Joey, why does your motherfucking life change? I'll tell you why. Because you got one foot in the grave when the, when the banana peel is stressed out as it is. With BlueApron.com, you get home and there's a box at the door with all the ingredients you'll need to make one of the most nutritious, tasty fucking meals and oh, a lot of their fucking recipes are in the 700 calories. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. For less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron will deliver seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Blue Apron knows when you cook with incredible ingredients, you make tremendous meals. So they set the highest quality standards for their community and with suppliers and family-run farms, fisheries, ranches, whether it's Japanese ramen noodles or the wild-caught Alaskan salmon. Blue Apron is bringing you the best. Do you understand me? Listen, recipes are created each week by Blue Apron's culinary team and are not repeated within another year. You customize your recipes each week based on your preferences. If you don't want a billy goat sent to your house, they won't send a billy goat to your house, all right? You choose delivery options to fit your need. There's no weekly commitment, so you can only get the deliveries when you want them. Each meal comes with a step-by-step -step recipe card and proportion ingredients can be prepared in 40 minutes or left. What less. While they're cooking, you're washing your monkey. You come out of the fucking washer. Boom, your dinner's made again. Let me tell you the menu this week on Blue Apron. Serrano pepper and, and goat cheese burgers. I would eliminate the goat cheese, you know me. But those Serrano <laughs> pepper fucking hamburgers are delicious. Lemon chicken with green beans. Tremendous. Shrimp. Uh, with uh, squid ink spaghetti. Are you kidding me? Again, shrimp with ink squid spaghetti. Who the fuck knows how to make that? Now you'll know how to make that. You meet a girl out, you look her in the eye, you go, listen, you want to come over to my place? I'm going to make you a shrimp with squid and ink spaghetti. They'll look, just look at you. Number two, spicy pork tacos with a nice crema on them. Ooh. And spiced salmon, nice and seven. And sweet and spicy. That's what they got from Blue Apron. Go ahead, Lee. You going to say something? No? It sounds delicious. Check out this week's menu and get the first three meals free. 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 And you get free, free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash Joey. J-O-E-Y. That's blueapron.com slash Joey. You'll love how good it feels, tastes, and create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So listen, you're going to make a good choice. Go to blueapron.com slash Joey. At the end of the day, Blue Apron, if you're single, if you're a family, it's the best way to do it. Go to blueapron.com right now. I want to thank Indochino for giving us a spot. I always want to thank onit.com. Go over there right now. In fact, I ordered some hemp protein. I ordered some uh, mixed greens. I ordered some uh, uh, shroom tech sport. And I ordered something else today. I just put the order in because... I'm all out, baby. It's time to re-up. I love you, cocksuckers. Thank you for being in my life. Tomorrow night, flappers. Next week, I don't know where the fuck. Oh, next week, I'm in a ball with Diagostino on Tuesday night. Anyway, stay black. Lee, don't forget about me.